Okay, great. So good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, and I am here to talk to everyone about clinical reporting. So as you know, my name's Ian Bancars. I'm a scientific associate in the clinical genome interpretation group here at OICR. So I'm going to start off just by introducing the general topic of clinical reporting. I'll talk about the different clinical assays we do for cancer. Uh, I'll talk about accreditation and validation. I'll talk about quality control. And finally, I'll try and bring all that together and describe how we build a clinical report. Okay, introduction. So you've heard a lot of technical detail over the last day and a half about file formats and sequencing methods and sample prep and all these things. I just want to start by taking a little step back and looking at the big picture here. So up here we have a quote from uh, Douglas Adams. Anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and is just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that is invented between when you're 15 and 35 is exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably make a career in it. Anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. All right, now personally, I fall into the second bracket. I am kind of old, I'm not that old, I'm younger than Star Wars. All right, and many of you, I imagine, fall into the first one. Um, you know, maybe you weren't, so the Human Genome Project was completed in 2000, 24 years ago. You may be a bit older than that, but when you were five, six, seven years old, probably you weren't closely following the scientific journals. So, you know, maybe this is kind of ordinary to you, but I just want to offer a different perspective that this is not ordinary stuff we're doing, okay? We are reading the human genome. We are taking the three billion chemical base pairs that contain the instructions for making a human being, and we are reading them in order to try and cure cancer. Now, personally, I think that's pretty cool. And it's been enormous progress over the last 20 years or so. Yeah, we've gone from it being a 10 year, $10 billion moonshot effort to read one person's genome to being able to do it in a week for a thousand bucks. You know, it's as if, um, so we sent the Apollo missions to the moon. That was great. It's as if 20 years later, going to the moon was like flying to Australia. It was within the reach of the ordinary person. Of course, that hasn't happened with space travel, but with genome sequencing, we have done it. And that's, you know, the technology is still evolving and advancing, as you've heard. And we've only begun to get to grips with what we can do with the existing technology and understand this data. So it's been a really exciting time in the field, and it's going to continue to be exciting. So I just wanted to put that out there for you to think about. All right. So as you've heard, we read the genome by aligning short reads. This is the Illumina sequencing technology. It's by far the most widely used. So our clinical sequencing pipeline uses exclusively Illumina. Uh, various other things, long read sequencing and so on, these are great. We'd like to incorporate them at some point. But just for the sake of running a clinical lab at scale, we're using the tested and proven Illumina sequencing technology. So we're reading the genome with short reads. Um, the human genome, as you know, is about 3 billion bases, slightly more. We have these paradense sequencing reads, which are 2 times 150 bases. So the, that's 300 altogether, which is about a factor of 10 million less than the human genome. So we're trying to assemble the, okay, it would be particularly hard to assemble from scratch. Of course, we have a reference to align against. But even still, we're taking tiny, tiny fragments, one ten millionth of the total, and trying to match it against this reference. And that is a pretty hard thing to do, because the reference contains ambiguous regions. You take a given sequence of 150 base pairs, it may occur multiple times in the reference. Uh, it has uh, repetitive regions. You may get thousands of bases that are just TA, TA, TA or just G, 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 things like that. Um, you can have alignment artifacts, you can have all, all sorts of things of that nature going on. And so, and of course, as you've heard, the sequencing technology itself has errors from time to time. They could be introduced at the sample preparation and amplification or on the sequencing instrument. So the base calls that we get off the instrument are not necessarily correct. And the main way we try and address this is just by sheer brute force. 
So we sequence the genome to a depth of 80 times mean coverage. So on average, every base in the human genome has 80 reads covering it, which is a lot. You know, uh, for many purposes, we could get away with less. But particularly since we're dealing with cancer genomes, which have been often mutated in strange and unexpected ways, we go for ADX depth of coverage. We could go higher, but at that point, we're beginning to hit diminishing returns. So ADX is a reasonable number. So we're doing on the order of 3 trillion base reads for each ADX genome, which is just an incomprehensible number. So early in my career, I worked for Selexa, who developed the uh, uh, sequencing technology that was later um, you know, bought and, and widely distributed by Illumina. And at that time, which was 2006 or so, the company's slogan was advancing genome analysis a billion bases at a time which at that time was really difficult to do. You know, at that time we were sequencing maybe millions of bases on a good day, a billion seemed out of reach. And then we got there. And now 20, well, not quite 20 years later, 18 years later, we're doing 3 trillion bases at a time. So the, the scale up here has just been astronomical. Oops. Okay, so as I've been saying, sequencing is very, very powerful. We're able to read this colossal number of reads, but it does have limitations. It does contain errors, whether they're errors in sequencing or um, errors in alignment or any other kind of errors. All right. So this brings me to the question of why we are here. All right, which sounds a bit philosophical, but bear with me. Okay. So in a narrow sense, we are here so I can talk to you about clinical reporting and in particular, the limitations of sequencing technology that limit what we can do with clinical reporting and how we address those, okay? But in a slightly wider sense, cancer exists in the first place because living cells also are not perfect at copying DNA. Yeah, cells divide, errors take place in replication, and mutated cells develop and you get cancer. All right, so we have sequencing errors, our own cells have sequencing errors, which is why cancer exists. But in an even larger sense, we are here at all as multicellular organisms because back in the primordial ocean, our distant single-celled ancestors also could not copy their DNA perfectly. So viewed on a sufficiently long time scale, sequencing errors are a good thing. But for our purposes here today, they are kind of a difficulty that we have to work around. So how do we do that? Okay, and specifically, how do we do it for clinical reporting? So what is clinical reporting? You've heard it discussed a whole lot today. In a nutshell, clinical reporting is a validated process to make a report for use in the clinic. Um, so there's a whole lot going on before we get to the final step of the report document. All right, so the beginning of the clinical report looks like that. It's typically five or six pages long, but this is how it starts off. So you have a letterhead with our information then you have some information about the patient and physician, uh, some more information about the sample identifiers, the cancer type, things like that. Then after this introductory stuff, the next thing we put still fairly high up where it can be seen is the treatment options, because this is typically the main thing that the clinicians want to know about. How do I make this person better? All right, so in this particular case, we have an actionable mutation. We've detected a mutation in graph, which has this FDA approved treatment. So, you know, that's great. This is what we want to do for everyone. This is what we're talking about when we say personalized medicine. And we can't yet do it for everyone uh, because of limitations of our understanding of the genome, because of limitations of resources. But this is the direction we want to move in. And this is, you know, only going to grow and grow. I'm confident in saying that. It's going to become more and more important and widespread in cancer treatment. Okay, so what do I mean by validation? Basically, everything has to be reproducible within the limits of uncertainty and measurability. So making things reproducible is good science, of course. It's also good clinical ethics. You know, we're using all this amazing technology to do, in effect, a diagnostic test and recommend treatments. And we want to be really confident we're getting it right. Yeah, because ethically speaking, if it's just a shot in the dark and we give them a a medicine, then, you know, that's far from ideal from a patient treatment perspective. 
Okay, so as far as possible, we try and lock this down, understand the limits of our methods and quantify them because uh, we are trying to push this technology out as far as we can in order to give the greatest benefit to the patients. So things we control, um, we track requisitions. So samples come in, we want to know where they are, we want to know what condition they're in at all times. Um, also, we have hardware and software testing. So the instruments are validated and tested. All of our software pipelines are validated and tested, you know, to the limits of our ability. And finally, we track our informatic and pipelines and output. So you've been using today some of the data analysis tools. These, for us, get run in automated frameworks. And again, we want to know exactly the provenance of any piece of data that we get out the far end. But we cannot control everything. So certain things we can't control. There is random variation in measurement. So for example, I've talked about mean depth of sequencing. That is only a mean. All right, because you are effectively just taking chunks of DNA and throwing them at the wall. Yeah. Um, and it is very much a random process, the depth at any particular location in the genome. Some will have higher depth, some will have lower depth. And it will be, diff you know, you sequence the same sample on the same instrument two different times, you will get two different depth distributions. That's just inherent to the technology. Uh, there's variation of biological samples as well. As pathologists, you're very familiar with this. Uh, there's limits of assay sensitivity. So there's a certain level of noise in our measurements. And if the signal we're looking for is below the noise threshold, then we can't confidently identify it. And sometimes there's uncertainty in our informatic solutions. I'll get into more depth with this later. But um, so we we're we doing like some really computationally difficult things here. And sometimes what comes out the other end is not a definite answer, just a range of probabilities. So we have to be aware of that and adapt to it as needed. Okay, so this brings me to clinical assays for cancers. So we have three or four main assays at OICR. I'll just quickly run through what they are and what they do. So an assay, just to be clear, uh, is a collection of measurements applied to sequencing data. So we have some sequencing data, we do some sort of standardized analysis on it, and we have a product that comes out the far end, which is a clinical report. That's the assay. And the assays must be validated. Okay, so our most comprehensive and probably most numerous assay is whole genome or whole genome and whole transcriptome sequencing. So sometimes we have transcriptome material, sometimes we don't. Um, transcriptome allows us to look for structural variants, fusions. Um, it allows us to look at gene expression, all of which feeds into the report. But if we don't have it, we make a subset of the normal report just with whole genome only metrics. Um, so we use this to detect somatic mutations. We do not look for germline mutations at this time. We could do, but doing that opens up a whole ethical can of worms um, because then you know, we may have an obligation to report uh, variants unrelated to cancer that may have an impact on patient health. And we need to have genetic counseling. We need a whole um, panoply of measures which we do not have the resources to supply right now. So we just kind of pretend germline mutations aren't there. That's our current compromise. So what we do report is uh, single nucleotide variants, indels, copy number variants, structural variants and fusions, as I've said, and expression, and a few other newer things. So uh, homologous recombination deficiency, this is a defect in DNA repair, which is often oncogenic. And also we look at microsite, microsatellite instability, which is another biomarker that can uh, inform treatment. And we have more things in development. Yes, question? Uh, we do, yes. So that feeds into homologous recombination deficiency, microsatellite instability. We don't look so much for motifs. It's more the level of individual variants, but that's something we might add in and expand later. Okay, great question. So the next assay is targeted sequencing, which is simpler, cheaper, than whole genome and transcriptome. So sequencing is a, targeted at a panel of variants. Uh, we compare it with results which have been supplied by the requisitioner, if any, from prior genetic testing. 
So in this instance, we found a TP, TP53 mutation, which was already known to the requisitioner. And here's the panel of genes we test against. So it's a dozen or so genes that are known to be relevant. And the last one, which is fairly new, it's been running for a few months, is plasma whole genome sequencing. So the idea of this is you have a patient who, are, who is in remission, their cancer is going away, maybe gone, and they've had previous DNA sequencing. So we have the sequence of their tumor. So imagine that the, you know, your therapy has been quite effective, most of the cancer cells are gone, but there's still a tiny population left. So those cells have a finite lifespan, they die, they break apart, and little fragments of their DNA wind up in the bloodstream. What we do is we sample plasma from the bloodstream and we amplify it up and we look for those tiny, tiny fragments of DNA, most of which come from normal cells, but there's a small number that may come from cancer cells. So we look at, again, getting back to mutational signatures, we look at mutations in the CT DNA and we compare it to the known mutations that we have from sequencing the tumor. And if they match up closely enough, then we can say we've detected um, residual disease and therapy of some sort needs to continue. So we have an example from a clinical report here. In this instance, we did find uh, residual disease evidence. Yes. Uh, any tumor, it works on solid tumors also, because again, the cells die, they break apart and they end up in the bloodstream. Okay, so section three, accreditation and validation. All right, so, you know, I've talked a lot about validation and how we want our assays to be good and accurate and reproducible. And we also want to be able to demonstrate that. And, you know, there are regulatory bodies that exist to um, handle exactly this sort of thing. So we are accredited by three different organizations, uh, CAP, CLIA, and ACD. We are the first lab in North America to achieve this, I think possibly the only lab so far, um, but we were definitely the first. And all three of these their requirements overlap to a large degree, but uh, what they have in common is they all have very strict and detailed requirements and they require regular audits, as you heard yesterday. So every six months we get inspected. Um, the first inspection for accreditation is very, very thorough. And then they have like less thorough inspections at periodic intervals. But we do have to be ready because, you know, they don't look at everything when they come and do an inspection now, but they could look at anything. So everything has to be ready for them. Okay, so... And so we have a standard procedure for validation. There is a, uh, this is not a metaphor, we have a document in our shared drive which is called Validation Standard Operating Procedure. And it's fairly long, but condensed down, it's like this. There are four basic things we want to validate for every assay. So there's sensitivity, which is the limit of detection. That's our ability to find relevant genotypes. There is uh, specificity, so ability to detect alleles in a specific sample and not in the controls. Uh, there's precision, so reproducibility under different conditions and reliability under the same conditions. And finally, there's accuracy. So that's our ability to provide correct results with respect to a known uh, reference sample. Okay, and this is applied to everything, okay? The, the form it takes varies as appropriate to whatever it is we're validating. But anything, whether it's a sequencing instrument, whether it's an informatics workflow, whether it's some kind of third party piece of technology or software, it doesn't matter. Everything has to be validated. Okay, so what forms does validation take? The first thing is we have to document everything uh, in pretty considerable detail. It doesn't have to be totally exhaustive, um, but you know it has to be very thorough. So we have what are called validation reports. This is a document for um, describing the steps we've taken to validate some sort of procedure. We have three of them at the moment, three of them for, or sorry, we have seven of them at the moment, three for DNA extraction methods, four for sequencing methods. Uh, for example, the whole genome sequencing document uh, is 112 pages with 21 authors. So these are not light reading by any means. 
and we try and cover everything as thoroughly as we can. We have a number of standard operating procedures, not just the one to make validations. Uh, we have 97 in total from accident prevention plans through to whole transcriptome library preparation. We've not reached the end of the alphabet yet, but you know we'll get there sometime. Uh, and we have version control. So all documents and all code, any changes must be tracked. Uh, releases must be numbered and tagged. So we're not just using the SOP as amended, we're using version 5.0 of the SOP or whatever. And similarly for software, you don't get to go in and just make changes on the fly. You know, you have to tag them, you have to know what you've done so that it can be reproduced if needed. So how you handle uh, validate, how you handle version control is a whole complex topic in itself. Uh, so we use Microsoft SharePoint for our uh, like uh, procedures and other documents. For software, we use Git, which is pretty much the industry standard. There are other tools such as Subversion, but the point is you have to have a tool, you have to have a system. You cannot just do, you know, SOP underscore final underscore modified underscore version 12 dot doc. We're not doing that. Okay, so the other thing we do is testing. Uh, you know, you can test all kinds of things. You can test Christmas presents. We test our assays quite thoroughly again. So we have in vitro experiments in the lab. We have in silico experiments with simulated data. Uh, we have automated software tests, which again is a large and complex topic. But, um, you know, we apply all the tools of software engineering to make sure our pipelines work consistently. And we also apply informatic and statistical analysis to our data to understand it. All right. So for example, um, this is taken from the whole genome and transcriptome validation report. So what we're doing here is we're trying to find our limits of detection for SNVs and indels. So we have a known truth set. We have some data where the SNVs and indels are extremely well characterized. But what we can, and okay, and we, so that's like a tumor genome. We also have normal genome from the same patient. And we can mix them together in varying proportions. Okay, this is not unlike doing a titration in the lab or something, but you know, it's, it's simpler and easier to do it in silico, in informatics. So we have these two BAM files effectively. You've worked with BAM files a little bit. And you can imagine we're able to mix them together in varying proportions. So we randomly sample reads from one file and reads from the other file, and we can choose how many to sample from each one and we bring them together. So this is what we mean by downsampling. Uh, so the plot on the left just shows the uh, proportion of variance in different populations um, where we've artificially set the variant allele frequency to 25, 15, 10, and 5%. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have a plot to show our um, sensitivity of the assay. So, you know, down at 5% variant allele frequency, we're still not doing too badly. You know, we can detect, uh, I can't quite read that. Um, yeah, some, some good number of, is that over 50%? I believe it is. So yeah, some good number of, of variants we can still detect. But, you know, that's not good enough. We really do want to be able to detect everything in our reference set. So you can see as the proportion of uh, tumor DNA increases, the variant allele frequency increases. And um, so at 10%, we're able to call all of the SNVs in our reference set. At 20%, we're able to call all the indels. So that is the text we put in each and every clinical report. That is our limit of detection. All right, so second one, uh, so this, so you've heard briefly earlier today about a tool called PURPLE, which is used to estimate purity and ploidy and also to detect copy number variation. So PURPLE is fairly new. Up until a few months ago, we were using a tool called Sequenza, but Sequenza was no longer supported. We had reason to believe PURPLE was better and more accurate. So we did a validation exercise to see if we could switch to PURPLE, which was successful. Um, so in the plot on the left-hand side, that diagonal line is the line of equality. So we're testing against a known truth set here called Oncomine. Um, so the purple things above the line were more closely correlated with the truth set in purple. And there's a handful of green things below the line, 
which were better correlated in Sequenza. So you can see on that plot, purple definitely has the advantage. Uh, the plots on the right-hand side may be a little small to read, but um, basically we're looking at false positives, po false negatives, true positives, true negatives in these two methods. So the red is um, purple and the kind of teal colored thing is Sequenza. So you can see they match up fairly well, except uh, Sequenza had many more false positives, which we've gotten rid of. So that's great. This new method is in fact an improvement on the old one, so we're happy to go ahead and put it into our clinical reports. And you know, if if a um, if a uh, uh, auditor came calling from one of our accrediting bodies, we can show them that document and show we've done our homework. So this next thing up here is validating a sequencer upgrade. So you've heard about all these various models of sequencer. You know, it's like new cars. Uh, here is the new Ford Fromage with uh, slightly different shaped headlights. You know, um, sequencing companies do a slightly a very similar thing. Uh, they're always seeking to improve the technology. Um, so Illumina's latest and greatest machine is the NovaSeq X, which is optimized to sequence specifically human genomes in parallel on a huge, huge scale. So the predecessor, NovaSeq 6000, was pretty good. NovaSeq X is even better for this purpose. Uh, I believe they named it before Elon Musk went around renaming Twitter. That was when X was still cool. So, OK, so we have here the NovaSeq X+. Plus. Once again, we need to validate it. We need to check it. We need to make sure that it's behaving consistently with our previous method. So what we've done is we've um, sequenced a half dozen or so biological samples on both platforms and compared the results. So you see here a small part of an enormous table in the report, which goes on for about 20 pages, comparing lots and lots and lots of different metrics on, these, on each sample on these two sequencing platforms. So you can see here purity and ploidy match exactly for this sample. Uh, tumor mutation burden is very close. Um, and we look at the percentile in the pan cancer cohort. So OK, 72nd percentile, 73rd percentile. That's close enough. We can live with that. So, you know, so far so good in our validation exercise. Uh, so here's more of it. We're also looking at individual variants. So there's this CDK and 2A variant, which was called identically. Uh, there's this BRAF variant, which has a slight difference in the variant allele frequency. But again, we've put the green tick of approval on it. That's, that's within reasonable bounds of variation. All right, so now I'm coming to quality control. So validation is applied to assays. It's applied to a process. Quality control is applied to an individual sample and the associated data analysis and report. So once again, you will not be surprised to know we have an extremely thorough process for doing this. And it's summarized in a QC report, which accompanies each clinical report that we produce. So I'm not going to show you the entire QC report because it's quite long, but this is an example. Uh, so this is the start of the QC checklist. So you can see we check you know, certain simple yet important things. When the container arrived, was it intact? Was it broken open? Uh, is it correctly labeled? Is it the right temperature? And these things are not guaranteed. There was a validation sample the other week where DHL actually lost it. Um, it took them a week to find it, and it arrived to us a week late. I think that particular sample was temperature stable, so it wasn't like an emergency. It hadn't thawed out and been ruined. But, uh, you know, we do need to check these things. Um, and uh, then we move on. So we come to actually do the sample prep, which has more QC metrics, which I'll skip over. And then we come to do some sequencing. So I talked about coverage. We're aiming for greater than or equal to ADX mean coverage. This sample had 86.7, so that's good. Uh, we want the insert size. So that's the distance between the two ends of our paradigm read in terms of uh, genomic basis. We want that to be over a certain threshold of 150 base pairs. And in this case, it's well over the threshold, so that's good. We want less than 50% duplication rate. Again, 10%, that's good. And you can see there are two sign-offs for this because it's considered an important metric that we want to make very sure of. Uh, and all of these sign-offs are recorded in a database again, should we ever need to refer back. And the QC concludes with some informatics QC, which is done by clinical reporters such as myself. 
So we look at callability, which is the proportion of exonic bases with greater than 30x coverage. And we want that to be over 75%. Um, and it was 98%, so hooray for us in this instance. But um, just to say callability, so that metric is not like handed down from, you know, it's not like uh, it's not like some sort of mathematically idealized result. It's just, you know, something that seemed like a good idea at the time to somebody to try and capture high quality sequencing. And we are actually reviewing it because it actually gives quite misleading results for some tumors, because as I've said, tumor genomes are usually radically altered. They're mutated in strange and surprising ways, where it's really quite astonishing the cells live at all sometimes. So it does happen that we sometimes get um, highly mutated cells that fail on callability, yet the sequencing has in fact gone well and we can get good data out of them. So we're trying to push the boundaries of that and come up with a better metric than th this definition of callability. So we also look at sample purity. Um, so again, you, this has been discussed a little bit already. And as pathologists, you know roughly what's involved. So they do a biopsy on, well, you do a biopsy on a patient. You're trying to get as much tumor material as possible, but there's going to be some normal cells mixed in. And we try and estimate how pure the sample is. So in this instance, 93%, that's great. So we can go on with our uh, assay. Okay, so just to say a little bit more about purity, because this is kind of an interesting and difficult topic. So as I've said, you get this mixture of uh, tumor and normal tissue, and we try to informatically infer the copy number state of each segment. So the genome is split into segments, uh, each of which has kind of a known copy number at, or an estimated copy number. Um, so you can see the plot there in the lower left is the first nine chromosomes with an indication of copy state. So most of them have um, slightly elevated copy number for the major allele. Some of them have deletions. Some of them have amplifications. In chromosome seven, we have a very large amplification, more than six times normal. And uh, we do that across the entire genome. Now, the plot on the right-hand side is uh, an indication of the estimation process. So we have an algorithm that tries to, you know, fit a model and work out what the ideal solution for purity is, but there's a lot of uncertainty in this process. This is what I was talking about earlier with informatic uncertainty. So we try to estimate it. Uh, so there are some areas where it's very sure it's not. So those are kind of the blank white areas. It's pretty sure that it, the purity ploidy is not in these regions. And there's some kind of pale blue where it might be, but probably isn't. And the dark blue is where the algorithm is fairly confident it is. And the sort of peak maximum likelihood solution it found is uh, where those two dotted lines cross. So 72% purity and 176 ploidy in this case. So I'm going to talk a lot more about this later because uh, purity and ploidy is a real challenge for us in making accurate clinical reports. And uh, if you're interested in how this stuff is estimated, then so the purple tool documentation is at that link and they have a, a fairly good, not too long or technical discussion of how it works. All right, so finally, this brings me to section five of my talk, building a clinical report. All right, so we've got all this stuff, we've validated it, we've studied it, we've studied it some more, we've sliced it, diced it, and now we want to make a report out of it. How does that work? Okay, so the idea of a report is to have an easily readable document that we can supply to the clinic. And we want to, so we want it, there's kind of a tension here. We want it to be readable, but we also want to pack as much information in as we reasonably can. So we include things like sample tracking information, analysis pipeline outputs, QC metrics, uh, clinical variant actionability. So a little while ago, I had the nice red arrow pointing at the treatment we'd identified. We, we provide that if we have it. Uh, and also expert interpretations. So members of the CGI team, we discuss each case among ourselves and uh, we issue a brief uh, accompanying statement to describe the report and the key findings. And we want this to be easy to read. 
So you've heard about all kinds of bioinformatics file formats and stuff today. So one of the things that comes out at the end of our pipelines is files in what's called VCF, variant call format. So this is a way of representing variants that have been identified in the genome with lots of accompanying information so we can understand what they are. And a line of a VCF file looks like that. Um, now I'm quite familiar with this format. I could sit down with the VCF documentation and parse out what it means. It would not be a fun or quick process. So there is still some work to be done here to summarize this stuff. And that is one line. So a typical VCF file from whole genome sequencing is 600,000 lines long. So doing this by hand is not going to happen. We need additional software to make the whole process work and generate the clinical report. All right, so what else do we do in order to make our clinical report? So we, uh, we rely very heavily on a LIMS. This is a term you may have heard from time to time. So LIMS stands for Laboratory Information Management System. And the idea of this is entities are tracked and barcoded in a database. And when I say entity, that is any discrete thing or person that is in the lab. So instrument operators are entities, uh, aliquots are entities, tissue samples are entities, uh, sequencing runs are entities, anything can be an entity. And if it's an entity, it gets barcoded and tracked. And we just scan the barcodes with the scanner such as you might see in a supermarket. So this is not unlike what you would do in any other like well-ordered manufacturing process. So if you're Toyota, you want to make cars as efficiently as possible. You have tracking of inventory. You know exactly how many you know, RAV4 steering wheels you have on the premises at any given time. This is the same kind of principle. And uh, so the limbs at OICR is called MISO. Uh, you have a picture of the MISO front page there, so you can search it for various kinds of things that we track and uh, just view the latest status of things and um, all that kind of stuff. All right, so we also have tracking for our QC process. Uh, this is, can be viewed in an interface called dim sum. We have a nice food mm -hmm. theme going on here. Um, so we track the process of QC status and the sign-offs I've told you about. This is the thing that generates the QC report. And so each sample must pass a series of quality gates. So, you know, the sample moves along. Again, you can think of it like an assembly line. It goes through various stages of assembly and analysis. And every so often we stop, we check on it, we make sure it's passing metrics. If it is passing, good, it moves on to the next step. If not, then unfortunately it has to go on the scrap heap. Um, and there's sometimes things we can do to rescue samples. For instance, if coverage is too low, we can go back and if we have it, get some biological material and sequence it some more to top it up. But uh, in the first instance, if it, pass if it fails the quality gate, that's it. We have to stop and either abandon the sample altogether or go back and take some kind of remedial action. All right, so we also track our analysis workflows. So each sample, uh, Larry showed you a very complicated flow diagram earlier of all our various informatic workflows and pipelines that feed into each other. Uh, all this activity, again, is heavily automated and tracked. So in, in principle, and this is how it works most of the time, occasionally something breaks and needs manual intervention, but it's, it's a very effective automated system, which is what we need to be able to run this at scale. Uh, so production analysis is a pipeline. So Pipeline, just to give you a little bit of, of background, is a term from Unix programming. So there is a means of chaining commands together on the command line, such that the output from command one becomes the input from command two. Command two makes some output. That becomes the input for command three, and so on. So very early bioinformatic analysis pipelines were literally pipelines. It was, and these are separated by the kind of vertical line character on your keyboard, which is known as a pipe. So the early bioinformatics pipelines were literally this. It would be one line which someone copy pasted into a Unix server and printed enter, and it would chunder away for a while and eventually produce your results. Nowadays, it is vastly more sophisticated. And we have systems, we have other systems to watch the first systems and all this infrastructure. But the good, which is quite a lot of work to set up and maintain, but the good thing is 
uh, data comes off the sequencer and the great majority of the time, probably more than 95%, it just runs right through to the other end without any human intervention whatsoever, which is great. It leaves us more time to work on more fulfilling things. So, okay, at OICR, we're departing from the food theme now. Uh, we have something called Shesmu, uh, named after an Egyptian god, which generates actions. So Shesmu monitors our, um, the state of all our workflows. It goes, oh, okay, workflow number one is completed. It's time to start workflow number two. It generates an action. That action is handed over to Vidar, which is named after a Norse god, and Vidar does the work of actually running the workflows, which, as Larry mentioned, are uh, the workflows themselves are written in a thing called uh, workflow description language, which was uh, developed at the Broad. So uh, we have all these workflows. They do their thing. They run. They generate data. That data is written to files. The files are recorded in something called file provenance which we can uh, query in order to decide when it's time to do a clinical report. Okay, so um, the next stage of the process is, um, so I talked about finding actionable variants. How do we do that? So we do it using something called OncoKB. Now, OncoKB is short for Onco Knowledge Base. It's maintained by uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Can Cancer Center. It's a very comprehensive database of variants and cancer types with um, links to relevant treatments. And so OncoKB defines a kind of hierarchy of uh, actionability for different variant types. And it does this for 7,885 and rising variants. So they're adding more all the time. It's growing quite quickly. Um, so here we have like the most kind of interesting and commonly used clinical levels of relevance. So the gold standard, number one, is there is an FDA approved treatment specifically for this variant. And as I say, we would like to get there for everybody, but we can't do it yet. Um, so occasionally we have to fall back to some lesser but still solidly validated uh, level of evidence. So the next one down, and also it has to be said, the FDA, as I'm sure you're aware, moves rather slowly. So it takes some time, even if it's a good treatment, to be FDA approved. So it's you know very common to do off-label um, use of various drugs and therapies, and OncoKB supports that. So you have... Um, at the very top, FDA recognized, and then further down, I won't read all of these out, but you have um, so standard of care from someone other than the FDA, uh, you have compelling clinical evidence, you have uh, evidence in another indication. So it's sort of, well, we're not sure how, you know, the patient has pancreatic cancer, we're not sure how well it will work, but this medication works really well for that particular mutation in lung cancer, say. So OncoKB will make you aware of that. And then further down still, there's some sort of laboratory or biological evidence, which is, you know, it's compelling, it's solid, but it's not validated to the extent of an FDA approval. All right, and there are even more tiers of actionability. So sometimes we're interested in drug resistance. This is something which has, it has lagged a little bit behind drug actionability, but it's really important because, uh, you know, I'm sure you're aware you administer chemotherapy, the tumor, and, you know, it's it's an, a process of natural selection. So you administer some sort of drug which kills some of the tumor cells. The ones that survive are very likely to be resistant to that drug, and they have some sort of mutation which makes them resistant to that drug. So at that point, you want to stop giving them the drug. Um, and... Uh, Again, these are not so well characterized, but it is slowly improving over time. And sometimes we can say, okay, we have identified a resistant mutation. Do not give the patient this drug. And further down still, so we have these kind of gray square categories. Um, these are things where the variant is believed to be oncogenic, but there's no specific therapy for it. And there's progressively lower levels of evidence for that. So if it's N1 oncogenic, then we're really very sure it's oncogenic, but unfortunately we don't have a therapy for it. And then further down the hierarchy, you have likely oncogenic, predicted oncogenic, and so on. 
And finally, you have prognostic biomarkers, which are, well, prognostic. OK, so finally, finally, at the end of all this process, um, we have the software to generate clinical reports. So this is done by a program known as Gerba, which uh, was developed in-house largely by me um, and also by the rest of the CGI team. And what Gerba does is it queries all these workflow results. It smushes through all these kind of very complicated VCF files and stuff. And it extracts out the information we want and it puts it into a user-friendly PDF document. Uh, and so we just run Gerba to generate a draft document. So this is kind of the automated output, but it undergoes human review. So genome interpreters like myself and other members of the team provide judgment and context. So we have to evaluate QC status and pure deploy solutions. Uh, we check whether detected variants are real. So you've looked at IGV today. We use IGV for every report to check the variants and just put a human not, not every single variant, because there's usually hundreds of them, but uh, you know, for like variants identified as oncogenic by KB, we look at those by eyeball just to make sure they're real. Um, and we also, as I've said, write a brief statement to summarize our key discoveries. Okay, so the end product of this process is a clinical report. So you can see a clinical report there on the left-hand side. It's very, very small. I do not expect you to be able to read it. This is just to give you a general idea of the shape. So at the top, we have our letterhead to say who we are and identify this as a report. Oops, uh, skipped one. Yeah, okay, so then we have some identifying information about the patient. So there's the cancer type, there's the location of the biopsy, there's various sample identifier codes all these are anonymized, so they're like patient number, you know, um, study underscore 807. It's, it's you know, because uh, we do not want to view their identifying data for reasons of patient privacy. Uh, and then, as I've said, the kind of, you know, key element that everyone wants to know about, is there an actionable mutation? So we report that high up. Uh, but we have lots more stuff underneath that. So, oops. Right, so here we go into more detail on these mutations. So here's the mutation we found. We say what protein, what type of mutation it is. We have the variant allele frequency. We have the gene expression status from transcriptome data. We talk about loss of heterozygosity. And further down still, we have a glossary to explain what these symbols mean. So this green number one is, is good because it, there's an FDA approved treatment. Okay, so uh, that just about wraps it up for this section of my presentation. So just to summarize, we have cancer genomic assays, which are conducted for patients. And in order to achieve accreditation and do this in a responsible and ethical way, we have lots and lots of testing and documentation and validation. Uh, so the validation is applied to assays, individual samples, sequencing, and analysis undergoes quality control. And finally, the assay results and interpretation are presented in a clinical report. So that is a, a whirlwind tour of the process we use to make clinical reports. Uh, does anyone have any questions?